All right, now we get to auscultation of the heart. On your exam, questions will have a patient on an examination table for you, and you can move a digital stethoscope around on their chest. You will have to integrate information in the vignette with the audio to find the answer. Before we get rolling, we need to make sure that we remind ourselves that the location at which heart sounds or murmurs are heard best does not necessarily correlate where the valves are located anatomically. So we have all prostitutes take money or whatever your mnemonic is. This is the different locations that we can hear murmurs best. They do not represent the location of the valves, but rather where you can hear the murmurs best. Remember that. So a commonly tested example is if a murmur is heard near the mid-clavicular line in the fifth intercostal space. So here, one, two, three, four, five. Which valve are we listening for here? We're talking about the mitral area. We need to talk about the maneuvers and how we can augment murmurs. So we can establish a few general rules here. So increasing blood flow through an affected valve or defect will lead to an increase in the intensity of the murmur. Or, on the opposite side, if we decrease flow, this will lead to a decrease in the intensity of a murmur. Now, how can we augment blood flow? Well, we can change the preload or the afterload with certain maneuvers, right? Maneuvers such as inspiration and rapid squatting will increase right-sided murmurs because they both lead to an increased venous return. Again, inspiration creating that negative intrathoracic pressure leads to an increase in venous return, and rapid squatting will do the same. Again, let's review what inspiration does. Expansion of the thoracic cavity and production of negative pressure drops the right atrial pressure, leading to an increase in capacitance of the pulmonary vasculature. And this also leads to a pressure gradient for more blood to return to the right side of the heart, and this will increase our preload and fill the lung vasculature. The end result is that the valves of the right side of the heart stay open longer, more rejection, and therefore more flow over the right side of the heart structures. Both leads lead to an increased intensity of right side murmurs. Okay, what about dropping it down low like this guy, hitting a squat real fast? So hitting this squat compresses the veins in the legs. It's like squeezing a container of toothpaste. This means we increase venous return. This will send more blood back to the heart we did not alter the pulmonary vasculature compliance like we did in inspiration. So this increased venous return will also send more blood to the right and the left side of the heart. So we also increase the left-sided preload. Now remember, we said more blood flowing over structures would increase the intensity of the murmur. This is exactly what happens in the first one we're going to talk about, aortic stenosis. So more blood in the left ventricle leads to an increase in flow. An increase in flow over these stenotic cusps will create a louder murmur. So why would squatting decrease the intensity of something like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, here is a simple diagram showing us what's going on in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Let's first understand why the murmur happens. This is a simple diagram. Here we have the aorta, the left atrium, and the left ventricle. Take note here how the hypertrophic myocardium bulges into the left ventricular outflow tract. Do you see this obstruction here? We somehow need to push this away to open up the aperture or opening for the ventricular outflow tract. Now, how in the world are we going to do this? We're going to do it like this. We're going to squat to increase venous return by compressing the veins in our legs. This increase in blood in the left ventricle here is going to push the hypertrophic subaortic ventricular septum away from the outflow tract. This is going to alleviate some of the obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract. So if we do the opposite, and let's say we stand up super fast, or we do something like a Valsalva maneuver, how's that going to change things? Well, instead of increased venous return, we're going to decrease venous return, right? We're going to decrease the left ventricular preload. And now we're back to the first situation where the obstruction is back. This is because less blood in the chamber brings the hypertrophied septum back to the obstructive position. So while we have these images up, let's discuss hand grip. So when you make a fist and squeeze, you compress the arteries and arterioles in your hand. Essentially, you're squeezing down the arteries to increase afterload. This makes it harder for the left ventricle to pump blood over the obstructed outflow tract. 
So there's going to be less blood being pumped over the obstruction because there's a less of a pressure gradient, right? So the intensity of the murmur is going to decrease with hand grip. Okay, so how does hand grip or increase afterload do the opposite and make the murmurs of a VSD or mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation louder? What well, all has to do with the increased diastolic pressure in the aorta? Let's look at this. Here is a ventricular septal defect. We talked about increasing the pressure here in the aorta by doing a hand grip maneuver. So do you think that the blood will try to squeeze into the aorta where there's even higher pressure than before? Or is it going to take the easier route and go like this and shunt from left to right? Well, it's going to do this, right? It's going to go the easiest way for it to go. This means that there will be more flow over the VSD and a more audible murmur. Now what about aortic regurgitation? Remember, we're increasing the pressure here in the aorta. There's going to be more blood that's going to push retrograde across the aortic valve leaflets. A similar situation occurs in mitral valve regurgitation, which we can see here. The hand grip will elevate the pressure or afterload in the aorta. This makes it a more favorable environment for the left ventricle to just say, hey, I'm going to pump across the mitral valve to the very low pressure left atrium. Now let's revisit the concept of increasing the diameter of the left ventricular chamber with an increase in preload volume to explain how we can change the murmur associated with mitral valve prolapse. So this image here shows us the left ventricle and the left atrium separated by these redundant floppy mitral valve leaflets. So these lines here resemble the chordae tendinae that the papillary muscle here are going to pull on to tighten the valve leaflets and prevent them from prolapsing. As you can see, this mitral valve is not normal. This is a situation that we have in mitral valve prolapse where there's so much excess tissue that the mitral valve leaflets can prolapse. The papillary muscles are going to contract and the chordae tendinae tighten very quickly to pull them back. When we have a lot of redundant tissue, sometimes this can, these vibrations of the chordae can lead to a click that we can hear with our stethoscope. So when this click occurs depends at what point in systole these valve leaflets are going to prolapse. If it occurs later in systole, this is when we have a large amount of volume or an increased preload in the left ventricle. This is because an increase in volume distends the chamber and brings these valve leaflets more flat so they'll look like this. It's going to be much more difficult for these valve leaflets to prolapse compared to the normal situation that we were looking at a second ago. So it occurs later in systole when you flatten the valve leaflets and now it's going to take a longer time in systole for the recently flattened valve leaflets to prolapse or billow. Now an increase in preload will therefore lead to a later onset of the click in mitral valve prolapse. But if we decrease the volume or decrease the preload, we're now going to have the click occurring earlier. And the reason for this is because there won't be this distension of the chamber and flattening of these valve leaflets. They'll actually bunch up and be more redundant. They'll even be like this, and they'll be incredibly easy to billow up. This means that the click will occur earlier in systole. So we've now discussed how increases or decreasing preload will change venous return, and also discussed how hand grip would increase afterload. One last thing we need to discuss is what phase two of Valsalva actually means and how that relates to auscultation of murmurs. So let's think about one thing first. Number one is that we have one phase of Valsalva before the second phase. This is when you bear down like you're going to have a bowel movement or you're lifting something super heavy like this dude. You begin to increase your intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pressure. Now to a certain point you increase this pressure and then you peak. When you hit this peak up here we are now in phase two of Valsalva. This pressure peak prevents return of venous blood to the heart. Remember this equation? Venous return equals venous pressure minus the right atrial pressure. We're increasing right atrial pressure because we're increasing intra-abdominal intrathoracic pressure. This decreases venous return and therefore decreases preload. For completeness, the third phase is when you release this pressure. And the fourth phase is when this pressure actually comes all the way down and then hits normal.